Okay, back to the skull this week. Um, we were talking about foramina and bones and that sort of thing. And I realized that the, there's quite a bit to the temporal bone that sometimes confounds students. So if we talk about the parts of the temporal bone, then when we talk about stuff that relates to it, it will be clearer and easier. I also get to talk about my gray hair. Grey hair, you say? What grey hair? Correct answer. Um, so temporal, um, we've talked about this before, but supposedly um, there's a reason why this is called the temporal region. Right? If you th you've got to think about the words that we use. Temporal refers to time, the passing of time. Oh, and there's something else I can add on to this. So um, why is this called the temporal re region? Well, in men, this is the area where hair starts to go grey first so it shows the passing of time so as a result everything around here gets, te gets called temporal so we've got the, the temporalis muscle we've got the temporal bone uh, we've got the the temporal fossa we've got the uh, the temporal lobe in the brain and that sort of thing see see when, when I ask students why the temporal lobe is called the temporal lobe and we talk about time they get terribly confused it's, it's just a it's a naming thing right Anyway, talking about the passing of time and going grey, there, there was an article in Nature recently talking about why we go grey. So as hair follicles produce the hair and it grows out, there's a collection of cell, cells there that add colour to the hair, right? And there's a stem cell population. And slowly over time, um, these stem cells migrate out of that hair follicle into, into the skin and they produce the colour of the skin, right? They, they, uh, uh, they become melanocytes, they differentiate. But it seems that these cells have got beta-2 adrenergic receptors on them. Right, what does that mean? Well, that means that these cells can be affected by adrenaline. They can be affected by the sympathetic nervous system. They can be affected by stress. You see where I'm going now? So it seems that over time, as you're exposed to stress, um, the, the, the activation of the sympathetic nervous system affects that stem cell pool that gives your hair colour and it drives more of those cells out of the stem cell pool. So as you get older, as you have had more stress over the years, you start to lose the ability to add colour to your new hair so you go grey, um, which explains a lot of things. I'm not doing too badly. See, I'm trying to manage the stress in my life. If the hair is a measure of that, which it probably isn't, it's probably... Um, not doing too badly. <laughs> anyway, back to the bone. Um, the temporal bone, whereabouts is it? Well, it's ear. So the, the, the external auditory meatus, the opening here for your ear, which leads to the tympanic membrane, that's in the, the temporal bone. Um, so we've got a few lumpy bony bits here. We can see it's making a number of shapes. And um, it's interesting partly because of its association with the ear, but also it's got two distinct parts, two big parts and then some other parts, and we'll talk about the foramina and that sort of thing. It's got this flattened part here. So this part of the bone, it's a thin part of the bone. This is the squamous part. If I grab a real skull, we can see that the flat part, the squamous part, is actually, it's actually quite thin. So the, the skull is thicker here and here and thinner here. So that's the, the squamous part of the temporal bone. And then inside it has a rocky part, it has a ridgy part, it's a big lump. This gets called the petrous part. Petrous, right? Petrified, turned to stone. Pe petrous, this is like a rocky ridge of bone in the floor of the cranial cavity. The third part would be then if we've got the, the squamous part, we call it flat, it's actually curved. The squamous part and the petrous part, the third part would be the zygomatic part. Look, this is the zygomatic arch here. It's actually made up of more than just the zygomatic bone. The temporal bone has this zygomatic arch extending anteriorly to the zygomatic bone, making this space here for muscles of mastication and what have you to go through and other muscles to anchor to. That would be the infratemporal fossa in there. It's one of the paired bones of the skull. So there's one on either side. There's a left one and a right one. It's part of the neurocranium, meaning it's part of the, the bones that are encasing the brain rather than the viscerocranium, the bones of the face. And it's an irregular bone. Okay, so here's the temporal bone. It's easier to see in color. What bones is it surrounded by? Well, back here, here's the occipital bone. So posteriorly to the temporal bone is the occipital bone. Superiorly 
we've got the parietal bone, and then anteriorly we've got the sphenoid bone. So the sphenoid bone sits here, the frontal bone is away away, and you can see the zygomatic part here. If we look inferiorly again, look, you can see how the, the sphenoid bone sorry, the sphenoid bone and the occipital bone surround the temporal bone. And actually there are some gaps in the joints here. Whereas we, here we've got lovely fibrous sutures linking these bones together. Inferiorly, in the skull, once we've lost the connected tissues of the joints, because there are some cartilage bits in here, we can see there are gaps between these bones. Now between the temporal bone and the sphenoid bone, we have foramen lacerum which isn't really a true foramen, it's filled with cartilage in life and it's a joint between those two bones and the internal carotid artery sits on top of that. Uh, but back here, here's the jugular foramen. The jugular foramen is a gap between the temporal and occipital bones. And while we're talking about the sutures, look here, this um, almost H shape of sutures meeting here, if you've got a good imagination, this is the terion with a T, pterion. Um, so there's a bit of a weakness here. You can see the bone is really thin. You've got the sutures meeting here, the middle meningeal arteries on the other side of all of this. So a blow to the side of the head is, is dangerous because the bone can be fractured fairly easily. And if it's fractured, the middle meningeal artery will tear and then you'll have blood being pushed into the space between the dura mater and the bone at arterial pressure and squashing the brain. Right, so We've identified where the temporal bone is, and of course, we've got to think about this in three dimensions, which is why it's always great to have a skull if you're studying the skull. What features can we find? Well, I said there's the external auditory meatus there, and we see this lump of bone here. So this lump of bone is the mastoid process. All right, we can palpate this. And nearby, we've got the styloid process, this spike, this stylus sticking out from the the temporal bone. So whenever we've got lumps and bumps, this is where muscles and ligaments and what have you attach. Um, so the mastoid process and the styloid process, and in between the two, we can see a foramen, the stylomastoid foramen, sensibly named. Um, and from the stylomastoid foramen, much of the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, drops out of here. And the, 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 the nerve fibers that are dropping out of here are going to innovate the muscles of facial expression. So that's passing through the temporal bone. And when we look at the root of the facial nerve, we've looked at it before, we see that it passes in here through this foramen. This is the internal acoustic meatus. And this is leading into the petrous part of the temporal bone. So inside this, this bony lump, we've got the structures of the inner ear, the semicircular canals, you know, the vestibular system for balance. The, uh, the cochlea and what have you. On the real skull, if we were to chip away at the bone there, we'd, we'd find those structures, all the spaces left by those structures. So in through the internal acoustic meatus passes the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, and the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight. So the facial nerve is, is passing into the temporal bone and it's, it's giving off a number of branches that find their way out through various cracks and fissures to get into the face to do the many jobs that the facial nerve does. Now it's, it's here that we see the internal carotid artery and the internal jugular vein entering and leaving the cranial cavity. So this is a really important site. And if I pass this pipe cleaner through the carotid canal, we can see where it runs. The carotid canal is part of the, of the temporal bone. And then right next to it is the jugular foramen. And the jugular foramen, as I said, is a gap between the two bones, between the occipital bone and the, the temporal bone. It's a big ugly hole because it's got a whole bunch of things going through it. Not only is the internal jugular vein draining almost all of the blood from the cranial cavity, from the brain, but through there we also see cranial nerves 9, 10 and 11 leaving the skull through there. So it's quite a big hole. And that's it, that's the temporal bone and the features of the temporal bone and the parts of the temporal bone. The other thing you might be asking is, where's the temporal fossa? Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's this whole bit here. It's kind of loosely described, but this region here is the temporal fossa, and this region here is the infratemporal fossa, infra below, right, this space down there. So, and that temporal fossa, as I said earlier, the bone here has got the temporalis muscle 
attached to it. And you can you can palpate the temporalis muscle when you bite. It's the large biting muscle, it's the large muscle of mastication that attaches here and runs down to, to the mandible there. All right. If you want to find out more about the muscles of mastication or the other bones of the skull, those videos are all out there. Go and have a look. But otherwise, see you uh, next week.